to welcome John Cruz, and I'm sure you're all going to be interested, at least I certainly am, in the things he's got to talk about today. So, John, thanks very much for coming along, and it's over to you. All right, thank you. All right, first of all, um, I'd just like to get started, get some idea who here is here today. Um, how many of you are graphics professionals or work closely with graphics in producing content art or anything like that? A uh, couple. Who here has implemented graphics programs or contributes to graphics software? And how many of you are just using and happen to have seen graphics at any point or anything like that? <laughs> All right, good, good. I think we have a little bit better going on here. Idea of what's who's hitting and have my little guests here from home keeping an eye on us, make sure I keep honest. So first of all, this is going to be covering a little bit about color management, what it is, why it matters to open source and to you as an individual. There's going to be a lot of different reasons someone might be interested, but chances are most people are. The question though is, what is color management? Now that's where the case of it's simple, but not necessarily easy. The primary goal is just to get consistent uh, visual output across whatever medium you have, video, print, inkjet, photos, display, um, and you want to match the output from different devices to be consistent. Now traditionally, the perception has been that uh, color management is really something that really only the abstract uh, arcane professionals off in their print house and professional services groups care about. And that it's the ma mathematical experts off in university, they care about it, but uh, really many who really should benefit from at least some color management are missing out. Now, there are many people who need color management but don't realize it. Probably one of the biggest um, groups are businessmen. There are so many deals that go out dependent on color that the executive or the salesperson or whoever may not quite know where you have to go and you're trying to pitch your company's services to a large company. You make a sales presentation with their logo, but you get their color wrong. And the person who's in interviewing you to possibly hire your company is the one who hired the graphic artist and who spent three months back and forth trying to get that exact say, shade of fuchsia. And if you mangle it, they're going to hate you. You know, all sorts of things like that. Uh, home users. <laughs> this is a new, hugest market being overlooked right now. Is that most people um, nowadays really have digital images and digital asset management and they don't know that they're running that. Like, how many people here have a digital camera? <laughs> Pretty much. Or a cell phone that can take pictures. That counts. <laughs> right, or a video camera. So all those start to come in and you start to collect all this up. And then when you, as a home user, used to be you had your pictures, you, you maybe shoot your video camera and you run it on your home VHS player hooked up to your TV when people come over to your house and that's it. So everything was yours and in control. But nowadays you go out, you want to put it up on your uh, MySpace page or your blog or you want to go out to uh, YouTube or throw it up on a photo sharing site or get, get prints from any of the online services. Even the corner drugstore now will do online one hour prints for 20 cents a print. So you're hitting all these other devices and one of the biggest ones is that there are certain companies who provide a main service for their graphics assets and utilities where, oh, you just throw together your photo album and they'll professionally print and bind it and send it directly to your grandparents, your in-laws, whoever. Uh, the, the problem there is if it's not quite right, you get the call back right after Christmas. So is little Timmy really that green nowadays? <laughs> so that sort of scale. And then any company selling product over the internet, anyone buying, as a home consumer, that, that comes back to anyone buying. So the number one, traditionally, the number one reason for returns of online sales is color. The shoes are not the right shade of red that you saw. The sweater is wrong. You know, it just won't work. 
so the current state of things right now is that the main operating system vendors, people here know who that is, basically Microsoft Windows and Apple OS did, they have long-running solutions and they've hit these problems over and over and they've had enough average consumers and professional consumers and business consumers to have taken care and incorporated the third-party vendors' feedback and fixed it. Um, Linux has been lagging seriously through these past years. It's, um, <clears throat> and even especially with running on top of X11 has all sorts of complications that other situations might not. For instance, right now, I have two computers running up here. <laughs> my presentation computer is hooked to the projector. My real computer is next to it. It's running remote X so that when I want to run a graphics app, its display is physically running here, but the program is physically running here, and if I don't have it all right, it'll just get confused. So where do, for basics, where do we fall? Well, the most basic is to eyeball it. You just bring up your camera and you twist that little color balance knob or your brightness, contrast, whatever, till you think it's about right and you go. That's been sufficient somewhat, but not anymore. Then there's ad, ad hoc, maybe you might call it, color management, where you try something. You're actually taking effort. For people using video cameras, the classic is you get a white piece of paper. So you're going to shoot Christmas with the family. You put the paper there. You point your video camera at the white paper. You hit your white balance button. It tunes up a little. Everyone's not quite as orange, and you're happy. Or for doing photography, you might put a gray card or a black and white card where you're going to be shooting. Take a couple shots so that when you go to work on your digital darkroom, you know how to tune it up and adjust. And also for color photography, you, there are color reference cards you can buy that have eight or 16 color spots. So you lay it there where you're going to shoot your still life, take your pictures, and then you, you have a reference point. Uh, then we move up a little more to where you're actually measuring, say, your color management, where you have colorimeters hooked up to your monitor, where you run a profile sc uh, or a scanning target in your scanner so that you get to see what, with a known input value, what color is your scanner telling you that it's getting when it's really probably not the right color. And there are a few different ways to do that. So here's the question. How many people here think they need color management? <laughs> Good, a few more at least. Maybe half right now. Um, one issue is anyone who has multiple displays. You're trying to slide your window from one to the other and it goes from green to blue. Ooh, just disturbing. It does, it's not quite the same. And if you're trying to do any graphics work, that's horrible. Doing photo prints either on your own inkjet printer, your photo printer, going to the online print, going to the service bureau to print out a banner for a conference. All that starts to really play, especially when there's any t kind of lag and turnaround, like you're going to spend a little money to have somebody else print it. If you don't get the colors right, you've got to spend twice, three times as much just trying until you get close enough. And purchasing online, that really matters. Sharing images, a lot of that going on nowadays. So I would wager that probably everyone in here and most people have at least some need for basic color management uh, if you have eyes in a computer. <laughs> even, if you, even if you're completely colorblind, managing the grays is important and will help you see things. Otherwise, you'd have difficulty and you might even miss. Uh, if you're, or, and, or, if you're contributing to open source software, from this point on, I really feel strongly if there's anything that's doing any kind of graphics, you need to at least define what your application does. Even if you don't change your code or your input or your output at all, you just declare what it is you're assuming so that somebody who's trying to fit it into a controlled workflow knows and can do the right thing. So now comes the quiz time. Quickly, who has multiple displays? Ooh, good number here, almost half, I'd say. Uh, well, what are multiple displays? That's a question. So multi-monitor setup at home, second monitor for your laptop, or two monitors on your desktop, right? Or how about anyone with a second computer? I'm running both displays at the same time off one computer. Cell phone, PDA, TV, M iPhone, iPod, any of those, you know, MP3 player, digital picture frame. That's a huge one that I just noticed. Just this past Christmas, those have come down to under $50 US, and they're all over. I, walk into the, I walked into my corner drugstore, and they had a bunch set up on the wall, at, at least 
eight for me to choose from. Uh, and a projector, such as this, anyone who's ever running, I'm looking at one screen here, looking at the projector, hoping you see what I want you to see, or um, even a toaster. How many, how many people think that's not a legitimate output device? I verified just yesterday, wanted to make sure, and there are at least four different toasters, including one at Evil Mad Scientist, that will, can be used for computer-driven output, including getting your morning weather display on your toast so you know if it's going to be sunny or not. <laughs> so now I'd say the good news is, well, first of all, let's go back one. Now, how many people here have multiple displays? Just about 80, 90 percent. Good, good. So you realize you need it. The good news is that, the, first of all, the quality devices are affordable and common. You can get something that does pretty good picture. It used to be professional quality color camera, a couple hundred US video cameras, scanners, all reasonable now that used to be only available to high end. Uh, then the users, because they're changing to this lifestyle where there's so much more media, so much more digital, and it's so prevalent for anyone walking into the corner store and pick something up, a you know, little digital picture frame this big, or digital keychain for your, uh, to carry your pictures on instead of your wallet. That's one thing. So we have the hardware coming up. We have the consumers being confronted with it and starting to realize they, they have to do something. And then we also have the collaboration across many open source projects really kicking up in the recent, recent time. And that's where, that's where I think this crowd really needs to pay attention because you're part of that and you should be part of this color management. And if not, for the most of you, you need to come up with at least a good excuse why not. Because it's going to be the consumers are going to ask you why. Why aren't you? So for developer momentum, which is maybe what a little more of the people here care about, it started really picking up around the time of the LGM, which was the Libre Graphics meeting, where one open source graphic program picked up and said, oh, let's invite a few more people to our annual get together. And maybe they might want to talk. Oh, how about them? Yeah, they might want to talk too. Turned out from one dedicated programs conference, it turned into a conference for anyone who produces a piece of software that deals with graphics or who uses one of those programs and, and intentionally included users and coders. And so many more projects started adding at least some color management. So right now the main focus, say, of the current open source CMS and that's color management system. So that you, you have to manage different things. You have to manage your, your display, your output. You have to know what colors are coming out to hit your eye? Because if the computer thinks it's sending you green and it's really sending you blue, anything else you do is not going to be valid. You, you're going to be just guessing. Um, your scanners, if you have a scanner at home, you want to know how that scanner behaves. Your printer, you have to know <laughs> when you go to print it out, if you have everything else right and you go and you take this, tune up this beautiful photo of an orange and then you print out a tomato, you're not going to be happy. And then you need to target what workflow you're looking at and what you're going to do. And what helps you through this are ICC profiles. You want to try to manage and maintain ICC profiles for everything. Uh, the key here also, though, is all these items also differ over time. So if you look at your monitor now and you come back a year from now, LCD is definitely not going to be as bright. The colors are going to shift a little. The hues are going to be different. If you don't know that, you'll get burned. But if you know that, it's easy. Just every couple of weeks, you just run through, do a quick check again, find out where your monitor is, and you're all set and calibrated and back on track. Now, multi-monitor, which more of the crowd here is going to be caring about, is a little trickier when you're on Linux especially. Some of the solutions are very vendor specific, you have, especially with Xenorama, XR&R, and, and a few other things. How you get, because when you throw up a, an image on one of, of your monitors, you want it to show up the same as on the other. So you're going to have to profile, figure out what your monitor, calibrate your monitor to make it correct as you can, Pro, find out how close you got it, and then adjust your output, and there, there's just, and then 
the programs are going to have to fetch that data from somewhere. And when you're on a remote system like this, the program running the computer or the application is not the program running the display. That's, that gets a little more complicated then. Now I'm going to take a moment. And, OK. Now it's time to switch gears. Again, hopefully we'll have some questions at the end, and we'll have time to cover that. But right now, how many people know what CMYK is? How many people don't know or aren't quite sure? Oh, just a few. Good. That's, that's much better. So the basic thing is that computers generally display, they don't display real colors. They display using little dots of red, green, and blue. So this is what your computer is going to throw out. Three different, and it's going to combine how much of each you get to see it. When you go to print, what you get is a an inverse of that, which are oops, cyan, magenta, and yellow are the primaries, which are the basically the inverse. They're the reflective, whatever. Who cares? It's math. It's science. You just care about how it hits the road, right? If you want the details, look it up. But the key here is that I don't just have three in my hand here. I have four. And the difference is the, well, one of the main differences is that little one I have in the center, they're black. That's added due to behavior of ink and different items and saturation and overlap. And there are many reasons for it. If you don't know why you need it, you may not need it or you may need to look into it. Now. I was going to explain what and why that matters. So the first thing I was just going to do, do a simple illustration to show you life in an average program. Um, my family has told me I cannot do any interpretive dance because I will embarrass them too much. So I have an alternative. In this case, I, in this case I'm just going to show how Normal programs, graphics programs, are going to handle red, red, green, blue display and work. <laughs> the main problem. Now, the main problem there is anyone who's familiar with juggling knows it's a little bit different. That when you go from three to four, it's not a matter of adding just one more. You have to change your entire approach. And the problem is when the average program tries to add CMYK support, uh, they try, but they don't quite get it well. So now we will have an illustration of the average CMYK program initial support. Now that, you know, it's a little silly, but that's kind of what happens, is it? Because poor CMYK is simple. <laughs> Getting it right, you have to consider not just the bits you're throwing up on screen, but how do you choose which percentage of which items to throw up, and how do you go forth from there? So now, it's a little time for a lesson of history and overview of color management and open source. Anyone still awake? Anyone? Anyone? Okay, so let's let's skip this real quick. That basically, there's so much detail, and if you want to drill into it, search on the right Google terms, and you'll find it great. The other thing is that you really care about what, where you've been, only as much as so you know where you need to go. Unix support is tricky. High-end commercial. Things do it well. Hollywood studios, print houses, they do it great. Average persons, Linux, Unix, it's so messed up. There, that's, that's the state of things. <laughs> we need to move away from that. Now, <clears throat> part of it is that X itself is central to so much uh, graphics on the desktop, on the Linux desktop. 
at this point in time, it's not really appropriate for X to handle any of this. There, there are a couple little things done to facilitate it, but that's it. There. So now, what is that? That brings us back to the early days on Windows 3.1 and everything else where each, say, like Adobe application managed the entire color management workflow all within, within itself because it couldn't count on the OS to just handle it for it. That's kind of where we are now. Uh, now, a few applications that do have support right now. CinePaint is one of probably the oldest. That was the, originally the film branch of the game made to deal with higher colors to work with um, film production and Hollywood and all that. Scribus is really good on print output, some of the best going to pre-press that I know of, uh, definitely for in the open source world. Krita, SK-1, GIM, you know, bitmap editors pretty much lets you do Photoshop style painting. Inkscape, others. Now GIMP and Inkscape especially came in a little late in the game, but it's picked up so much. Now that we're done with where we've been and what's starting to go on, what, what do you care about? There are a couple tools available out there. The Argel color management system lets you track profiles, pr measure your devices, adjust your displays. And so it's mainly a, a library and a collection of command line utilities that allow you to do this. It goes graphical in the point that at one point some of the apps throw up color splotches on the screen for your hardware measuring device to measure, and that's it. Arenos is a similar project from a different viewpoint. These two, I'd say, are, are done by people who really know the field and the mathematics and the arc, all the arcane details of it. Then LProf is a little spin-off. This is for creating and managing profiles. So this is what, in day-to-day, -day, if you're not using one of the other two to do this, LProf will help you visually create profiles of your scanner, your printer, your uh, display. And XICC is a little utility that lets you hook a profile onto an individual X display or a monitor. Or there's a little discussion, there's a little confusion for multi-monitor. So if you have a multi-monitor set up, get with the guys to help them work it out well. But that lets a program who knows about it just say, oh, I'm running on these two windows. Give me those two, give me their profiles, and then adjust from there. Then there's one other thing added for the tools for the people here is the little CMS library. This is what Inkscape and GIMP, we heard the presentation on this at the first LGM. M Marty Maria was really great, told us how simple it was to get it right. It does all the math and everything, all the hard part. We just need to know to use this, pull it in, call it at the right time at the final, just before you display part, not in the middle over and over as you're compositing, and you're done. And literally, I hooked this into Inkscape to get basic correction of placed images in under a week total from when I sat, you know, like sat down on a Monday by, fr by Sunday it was done in and uh, with doing everything else. And it even helped Inkscape pass one of the SVG test cases. So anyone out there who's thinking about hooking something in, that's definitely, you know, at the very least consider that. Uh, Scribus, I mentioned, is for preprint workflow. Now, this is where my history as an Inkscape developer comes in, as I care about SVG. <laughs> and they need to do more. They've told us they need to do more. We know they need to do more. So it's improving, but for print, right now, it's very good. It needs to be just a little more perfect for the really complex stuff. And they have a little bit of links, a little bit of info. Uh, we have some, I put the GIMP release notes info on here. Maybe I should split it on up. But this has a quick little one-shot graphic that shows you a little on the color management flow. And again, GIMP got theirs hooked in the fall of 2007. And there's a little bit going on that. The, I picked up recently a Linux format magazine that had a good article on how GIMP does color management and how you can use it. And there are some resources out there about this. So if you're doing raster photo editing or anything, that's handy. Inkscape had some rough support initially, and the 044 support was the initial, wow, Marty told us how easy this was, let me try, and it, it worked. Uh, 046 added the display adjustment, XICC support, soft proofing, so you can preview what colors won't make it when you go to hit your specific printer, and a little bit more. Now we're gonna move on for production, and who cares why, where. 
for web graphics, you might set your system up right, but the end user is going to be all confused. How do you deal with that? Well, one of the things is you just know that. And knowing that, you put in little checks here and there, like you send your customer, uh, if you're doing professional work, you send them a physical sample of the color, a little color chit or cloth or whatever, so that they can say, ah, yes, that is what I want. Uh, even certain places doing carpet will do that for you. You're going to order carpet online, ask for a sample, they'll send you a sample so you can see, oh, that's not what I want, I want the other one. Um, no, sRGB is the color space picked just to say, oh, for the average home user, it's somewhere in this ballpark, uh, close enough. So if you target that for your in-display, if anyone's really way out of that, it's their fault for having their monitors all whacked and they need to correct it on their end. <laughs> Otherwise, it's, it's rough enough, though, that it will cap cover most users. So you can work targeting that, but then you want to preview with the variations like Mac versus PC, it used to be like a 2.2 gamma versus 1.8 gamma, 10% color difference. You know, make sure your graphic will work on both. Maybe you want to tune it up to be in the middle. Preview with maybe mobile devices nowadays, especially with Android and iPhone and everything else in addition to all the other cool phones that never show up in the US. Those, those are a little better. Uh, print graphics, you need to get if you're using Inkscape and Vector, you want to mark it with an ICC profile so you know what colors really you're using as long as it's not the SVG-defined sRGB. Now, for CMYK, there is a big caveat I want to really harp on there, point out strongly. There is no CMYK color space. There's not a color space. The problem is, you're, you're going to separate into CMYK, you know, four color printouts for a specific printer. And even different, different printers of the same model and the same manufacturer you bought at the same store on the same day will print out differently. So you have to try to target that. And sometimes if you're going to a professional print house, they'll give you a generic class of one that say, okay, this is a standardized one. We, you correct to this and then we'll t tweak up from there for the final run. But if you don't have that, you have to try to, and especially on your own printers and your own printout, you want to get each individual printer and update them periodically because they do go out of date. Then there's also, you can have a profile listing spot colors like Pantone or some of the other color matching prepaid systems. If you work professionally with those, you might encounter those. Those, for instance, aren't supported in SVG 1.1, but in SVG 1.2 proposed that they will. May or may not. And SVG is different from most photographics, is, is that you can work with multiple profiles all at the same time in one document if you really need to get that complex. Usually you won't need to, but if you have specific needs, you can do that. And again, using a profile for proofing, whether it's a CMYK or in any other output, will let you preview the colors you can and can't get and the changes and the shifts and the contrast drops and everything else you'll get. For mobile devices, I'm going to just skim over a little quick. You can check the slides online. But the main thing is that it will let you try different devices without ever having them. And if anyone's ever looked at something they've done on more than one mobile device, it's never the same. And then for cross-application integration, this is where I want to harp on developers out there. We need to make as many as possible color managed. And in the simplest case, if you're dealing with RGB values, 8-bit, 16-bit, doesn't matter. If you're not going to do anything else, just clearly define you're using sRGB. That's, that's what the W3C did. They said, OK, in, in lieu of anything else, assume this. And not, oh, this is the RGB that my monitor shows or that my printer shows. So what's next in this? Is it, well, developers need to add support to more applications. And users need to ask for support in more applications. And then developers need to add it to a few more. And then those users ask for a few more. And we want, need to get this cycle going. One of the things that this is really going to do is help us really nail the consumer market. When they start saying that, oh, I'd like to switch to the GIMP, but I, I have to work in CMYK I can't, uh, to do my work. I can't do it. You've got to take those excuses away from them. And, and then 
if you have friends or family and you want to help them, you want to give them a digital photo frame for Christmas, if things are supported, they'll be happy. You know, then they know you're not really purple or whatever. Now let's look at time, time, oh good. Still have a little time. So I was just gonna show an illustration of the big problem here. All these points, we, we're not sure what's going on, but at the end result, you, you have an orange, somebody on the other side of your telephone line looks at your website and sees a lemon. Mm, not good. Also, here it is, you take a picture, you bring it up on your computer, you saw, you saw orange, now it's tomato. Uh-oh, that's a problem. So you tweak it up, turn it back into an orange. Right, good, except the problem was your monitor was displaying wrong. It's old, it's huge shifted, so your camera really did a good job here in steps one, and your computer did an okay in step two, but once you had it on your computer, when you manipulated it here in step three, you think you fixed it when you actually broke it worse. And when it went out, end user's all confused. He doesn't want to buy a lemon, he was looking for orange juice. To correct that in this instance, you get your display system calibrated, profiled, locked down, corrected. Then you can see, oh, you really did, did, well, the camera almost got it, but it was a little washed out. You had too much flash on there. You pump, pump up the colors just a little bit, throw it out, and then a good user on the web sees the right thing. Here's the question. What happens if his system's all messed up on the color? Get the he might get a lemon, might get a tomato. Might get a plum. I've seen that. Oh, man. But <laughs> the point is, since you know what your system wants, you have a known reference point, you know what you have. Notice the theme here? You know what the state of this is. You know the workflow all the way through here. You, you then know the problems on the other side of the net. So then you can tell the person, this has been managed on this side of it. You just need to adjust. This is supposed to be an orange. Just tune your monitor till it looks orange. Or check Pantone 152. I don't, you know, I don't know what color that is, but that's another option. So that's what we had here. You are all correct, but in the end result, the end user is wrong. This is basically the situation, if you're producing graphics, you're gonna be in this situation. So just know how you're gonna handle it because you can't control your system. You can say, if this does not look orange, fix your system or call me or whatever. Jumping over to the next workflow, starts off similar, but we're gonna go out and print. Now here we have same thing, take a picture of an orange, got a tomato. Oh, wrong thing, fix it, print. Now you happen to be an artist who, you, you liked your one printer. So you have one of these upstairs, you got another one downstairs so you don't have to run up and down. So you have the two, same model, same make, same manufacturer, you know, but one's gave you, one gave you an orange, one gave you a lemon. Ooh. The problem is here, because this was wrong, the printer that, the printout that looks right was only by accident. You don't know that that's what it should have done and it may not do it. And you may not be able to reproduce it because it's not known. So the first step for a little less bad workflow is the first, first dis, you gotta get your display locked down and correct and everything. Then you know, same thing, you, you know this part of it is right. You look at the printout, oh no, wait a minute, this printer was actually right. Worst case is where you have a misdone workflow and you tweak this printer or you change ink or you bring down the level or whatever when it was actually right and you shouldn't be messing with it. Now we know, oh no, no, it's the other printer's messed up. Okay, let's fix that one. So the way, say, you would fix it here is you don't treat printers identically. If they're yours, do test runs, measure the output, LProf if nothing else can help there but you end up with two profiles, ideally, one per printer, then you get the exact same thing on your display and on every single print you print out. 
Okay, just a minute. So before that, uh, I'm going to probably, in, in doing this, I had to cut some things way down. So in my website, I'm going to start throwing up more and more simple samples so people can you know, have a quick visual overview of what situation they're in and how to get out of it. But now this is to display. Well, who know, who's familiar with ICC profiles to begin with? A yeah. couple. OK, good. Um, here are some in a sample in an application I have in my other OS uh, to be remained unnamed. It gives me this nice 3D rotatable display. So I threw up a few color profiles. Are these the same? I don't know. That, they're not. They're different devices, but it's a little hard to see like that. So I decided to compare them one by one. Here I profiled my laptop display versus my old analog LCD monitor hooked up next to it. Now that I've overlapped them, say I can see that, whoa, this monitor show, this one shows a lot more color range than this one. So if I want to show a really, really aqua, aqua or cyan, cyan, or a really, really orange, orange, the, the external monitor is going to do a better job. Here's one compared to my recently new um, television. My TV is doing better color than my laptop. <laughs> so if I'm going to be doing some color work, it might be better for me to hook up to my TV. HDMI, digital, better quality, higher resolution than my laptop, but, uh, and more accurate color representation. Now, here's the one that got me. I mentioned the sRGB color space. That's the W3C's standardized, close enough, average target. That's what everybody has. Well, I don't. You see, it, come, it whew, can show all those colors. I can't. It can show all those. I can't. So one of the things this tells me in doing the, the profile is if I have my software soft proofing and doing sRGB and I've got a profile for my display, my blue blues are going to show up as autogamic colors and it's going to warn me. You're not really seeing what the other people are going to see. It's going to be too dark for them. Oh, okay, I took it up. Okay, no problem. If I know what's going on. Now, here's just comparing. The colored one is my laptop LCD. The gray outline one is a CMYK printer. The shape of it is completely different. So it's not just scale of colors. It's really uncertain what kind of colors you'll get. But that's the generic CMYK. Now, do you remember I said there is no, there's not a CMYK color space? So if I try to use that color space to target my nice photo inkjet printer at home, boom, it's not going to work. The color, in this case, the color one is the generic CMYK. But the other weird one with even more range is my particular printer. Or the, the manufacturer says, for my line of printer, this is accurate. So this is going to be close. If I'm an artist, I want to actually measure the output. But in this case, you can even see the shape of it is different. The, the uh, generic CMYK shows more yellow and red than my printer can, but my red shows more, or my printer shows more purple and green. <clears throat> You know, you never know until you check. So, real quick. Oh, wow. Exactly on time. Okay, time for questions. Anyone in the audience have any questions somewhat related to color? <laughs> yes. Okay, where color management is at in Inkscape for printing right now? It, Inkscape can attach color profiles, any number of them for any number of objects, although you usually will have one. There are cases where you might have a few. You know, we've been talking about that in mailing size, and I told people, no, 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 there are cases where someone will need, especially a uh, graphic professional doing print, they're the people who encounter those cases where they have a, a cutout where they have the cover of a something in one paper and there's a cutout to the other paper and they're doing one image for both and they want it to look close but they're printing on glossy paper on one and matte paper on the other, you know, cases like that. So we can, Inkscape will preview that, will let you specify it. The color, only one color picker out of all the Inkscape color pickers is accurate though. The others will only do sRGB. 
So that needs to be improved. Yes. Yeah. No, no, no. The CMYK color picker lies. I've been, it used to lie a lot worse. That's some other internal history, but um, I've been even told I should remove it because it just lies. Yeah. See, you can tell it's an artist who's saying that. Now, the other thing is once you have an SVG with color specified, though, how, how do you hit print right now? Scribus can kind of get some things in, so if it imports into Scribus, okay, then you can go to PDF and out. PDF, unless you're targeting sRGB, won't quite work. You know, there, it still needs more work. But right now, Inkscape uses Cairo for the back end to create the PDF, and Cairo people came to Inkscape people and said, what API changes do you need to support this? So it is ongoing now. Might be months for it to show up, not years, definitely. So, and there was even a person here who was poking around on the Scriber side of things, and we have people here, and we have people, uh, oh, no, oh no, not Scriber side of things, sorry, Cairo. So that we have someone who's poking at the guts of Cairo trying to make it happen. I've been bugging the Scribers guys to give us use cases so we know what PDFs we need to push the data through Cairo, pop out PDF, hand it to Scribers, Scribers goes to print. What does that PDF we hand off need to look like? And they're starting to give us those cases. Okay. Well, there are some colors, there's the Munsell color system, there's a few other matching systems out there that have been proposed. Uh, the first thing is, if you are a graphics professional, most likely you will buy Pantone books to tear out chits and hand them to your customer. As an end user, you have all those end user rights to do things to it. Me, as an application producer, I can't grab their data and put it in, because, Aside from any other patent and other dis defense, I can't be sure my program is going to give 100% accuracy, so they may not want me to put it into my program unless I guarantee to Pantone the company that I will. So, you know, there's two sides on that. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, so alternatives to Pantone that are free, so you're clear and your conscience is fine. There are some out there. Start pushing, start finding. But the big one is just know if you don't have it. Print your own color samples. Don't call them the same numbers. Don't call them the same colors. Print them of the work you're going to do. Send them a color sample of what you print out. As long as you guarantee what the printer delivers is going to match what you printed out, the customer is happy. You don't have to give them even numbers. You can do your little sample board that is a sample printout of one page that has everything on it. And they can say, OK, these colors work together, and they are OK. If you have managed your workflow, you know they will work. Oh, by the way, I just want to point out, this is the hardware I picked up just recently, is, as far as I can tell, open friendly. The, the CVS version of LProf supports this. If you get the prepackaged version, it won't. But this, particular, this particular one is a uh, Huey Pro sold by Pantone, but it came from someone else. They just marketed it in the US. These, are maybe $60 US on normal price. Uh, and all, all they do is have a row of suction cups like a squid, little sensor in the middle, stick it on your monitor, run it through the software. Argal or LProf, I've used both, work fine with this. So I know in my hand, here's something that really works. And if you don't mind paying for hardware with that name on it, you might be big and happy with this. There's some others that are low cost, but they take firmware injection to get them working. 
So you have to get the firmware off the disk you got when you bought the device, and then, then the free systems will work. Okay. Yes. They don't. That's one of the things. Well, X, because as you start, con just consider the setup I have right here. I'm physically hooked up to this computer, but the application's running here. So this computer is the one that knows what its display is like, but this application has no access to this computer's hard drive. Now, they d in the X level, I can attach a local file as a profile, and then this application over here can grab it over the wire. The application has to know that. There's not any simple way for X to do it. If you want to scan mailing lists of all over or jump on somebody's chat room, they can explain. But I, I will vouch for the X developers. It's, there's no simple path that's appropriate for them to take at this time. And, and then printing, there's a big mess there. Cups needs to do a little more, and there's a few other systems. And I've been wa monitoring some of the mailing lists. There's an open ICC group that is a lot of these programs getting together to deal with color management, so Scrimp, or GIMP, Scribus, Inkscape, other people, the Orinos and Argal people are all on there. And CUPS, that is an issue. How do we get the print part to work right? Because it's, do you pre-apply it or do you post or do you change it here because you might lose data that when you get to the end printer you want, you know, so that it's a little tricky. Um, yes, working towards OS color management. There, um, I think Orenos and Argal both are trying to do it. In fact, I know for sure Argal is trying to be cross-platform. They want to be the appropriate platform or end-to-end, -end, all the way up solution for Linux, Mac, and Windows. So they don't want to be only the X solution. So you know, they're, they're working towards that. But on the other hand, all the other individual pieces are trying to work together. And then if, say, like, if the application supports profiles attached to your X display, but you never attach any because everything else is working, then the application will never do its thing. It will just keep doing its raw data, and then it will be handled on the back end. So there is that flexibility. Yes? Um, oh, is, is the only way to get the right profile to use one of some hardware device? If you want to be right, yeah. If, if you spent more than um, $200 US on a camera, you really want to own something, even if you buy one of these used on eBay or someplace else. Can you get close enough, though? LProf can, and some others can let you get close enough. You can get gamma adjusted. You can get a few other things. You can get somewhere in the ballpark. Or if you get a known color target sample, those might run $30, $40 US. You take a picture with that. If your camera is profiled and everything else, then you can tweak your monitor that way or measure it that way. But you know, more, it's more that LProf at least will walk you through getting a, a ballpark profile. It won't be good, good. And it won't make you happy. But it might make you OK. So, any other questions? Real quick, we're trying to finish up the last few. Yeah. Um, in your experience, if you go to like a, a company that prints photos, just one of the local ones that do it, do they usually acknowledge the color management stuff? Do you give them a CD or do they pay for something? Do they really try to get the off their opposite? Usually, what you want to do is test it first. Because some places may or may not, you want to do a little sample. But for, for like JPEGs, that might be the easiest way is you go give them the CD with JPEGs that have the right profile inside them. Chances are their workflow will read that profile and say, oh, yeah, zip, there you go. Yeah. OK, any last question or going, going? All right, gone. Thank you very much. Uh, Pleasure to listen to. Oh, good. Congratulations on a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you.
a couple of little gifts for you. I mean, they belong in that bag, but we had to use it for something else. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. It's uh, just a reminder: uh, in anyone going to the uh, professional developers' networking session tonight.